Hello all, uh, I'm Professor Dragon Illich from the School of Public Health and welcome to this module in which we'll cover research designs. So here are the um, objectives for module one um, and the main emphasis of this presentation um, is to revisit the different levels of evidence um, available um, and for you to also be able to differentiate between the different study designs um, that including RCTs, cohort studies and case control studies. So here we have the typical evidence pyramid, um, systematic reviews being up at the top um, uh, when we look at the different study types. Um, RCTs are at the top of the pyramid um, and then we transition down to cohort studies, case control studies and um, expert opinion down the bottom. Um, in part, the evidence pyramid is designed like this due to the type um, and number of um, uh, biases that we can control for um, across these study um, designs. So we've got four different types of um, research um, or biases that, uh, that can influence um, uh, research designs, that being selection bias, performance bias, attrition bias and detection bias. So the beauty about RCTs is that we can control for all four biases um, uh, in, in a randomised controlled trial, um, simply by randomising, um, blinding and um, performing an intention, intention to treat analysis, um, we can um, minimise the effects of um, those four biases. Um, it's for that very reason that RCTs are placed at the top of the evidence pyramid um, and then um, cohort studies and case control studies follow it um, because uh, cohort studies and case control studies can't control for those four biases. So for example with a cohort study um, you, you can't necessarily um, control for performance bias um, because the um, participants have already been exposed to um, the risk factor or, um, or intervention. Um, similarly for um, case control studies, um, uh, there's limited number of biases that you can control for. So just going across the, the different types of review, um, article, sorry, the different types of research designs again, um, we'll focus uh, firstly with systematic reviews. Um, so as the name suggests, um, a systematic review um, is systematic in the, in the nature of how studies are identified. So um, let's say we're, we're conducting a systematic review, our search strategy identifies five particular studies. From that, we will have a specific inclusion and exclusion criteria um, on which we base um, our preference to include studies. Um, or um, if, if they don't meet the criteria, we exclude them. Um, however, we're transparent in, um, in this particular process. So we, uh, for example, might do a systematic review and one of the key criteria is that the um, study must be an RCT. So in this case we've included three that are RCTs um, and two we've excluded uh, for the reason that they're either a cohort or a case control study. From that, um, or from those included studies, we can perform a meta-analysis. Um, mind you, we don't always need to perform a meta-analysis when conducting a systematic review, um, but majority of times um, we, we do perform that. Um, and a meta-analysis is, is literally um, pulling the data together um, across those three studies, um, accounting for different methodological issues as well as the sample size in order to get a, um, a pooled result. Okay, so focusing on an RCT, um, so an RCT um, is prospective in nature, moves forward in time. Um, we'll have a sample of um, participants, so in this case we've got um, our, our hypothetical case of pregnant women. Uh, we randomise um, in order to minimise the impact of selection bias, um, either to um, a, an intervention group, so in this case we're saying it's folic acid, um, and we're comparing it to placebo. Um, in this case, we try and blind um, the, the, um, the, the intervention in comparison. So um, if, they are, if they are in tablet form, try and make the tablet um, look the same, smell the same, taste the same, etc. across the two uh, groups. The only uh, difference being that one has uh, the folic acid and the other is a, um, a strict placebo. Um, and then we'd follow them up in time. Um, yeah, 
nine months, whatever it may be, um, in order to identify um, the outcome. Um, and the outcome um, at this stage, we'd um, look to blind the person assessing the outcome, not in terms of whether or not the outcomes occurred, um, but whether or not um, they could identify whether the patient um, was part of the intervention or comparison group. So detection bias is, is blinding the um, uh, person assessing the outcomes, um, but blinding them from a perspective that they don't know whether or not the participant was in the intervention group or the comparison group. Crossover trials, as the name suggests, um, patients cross over. Um, so they're randomised, much like a, um, an RCT, um, to one group um, or another group. So in this case, we're looking at aspirin versus uh, placebo. Um, we follow them up after a, um, a particular um, a amount of time, um, after which um, we'll uh, remove the participants from the intervention and control. Um, so this is known as a washout period. Um, it depends on how long the, um, the, the drug or intervention is, is usually active for. Um, but the, the role of the washout period is to try and um, get back to a baseline uh, level. From that, um, we have the crossover. So those that were in the placebo group now receive um, the, the intervention and those that were in the, in the intervention uh, now cross over into um, the uh, placebo group. And then from there on, we can then um, uh, obviously um, uh, measure the outcomes. Um, one of the advantages of doing a crossover trial um, is that you can double your sample size. So um, if you've got relatively small numbers of uh, participants, um, by, by having this um, initial phase and then a washout period and then a second phase in which you cross over, um, you're basically doubling your number of participants or sample size. So a cohort study, um, you can think of a cohort study um, much along the same lines as an RCT. Uh, the only difference is we don't have that randomization aspect. Um, so patients are um, already exposed to the um, risk factor or the intervention. In this case, yes, I did take folic acid or no, I did not take folic acid. Um, and then the same principles apply uh, moving forward in terms of um, uh, assessing um, and being able to blind um, uh, at, a, at an outcome assessment uh, viewpoint. A case control study, um, unlike the um, other studies that we've mentioned so far, is always um, retrospective in its design. Um, so it starts off um, with the sample and we start off with the outcome. So in this case, um, our cases, um, women, women um, who have had a, a pregnancy um, affected by an NTD um, and then we work backwards in time so to speak um, whether it be through accessing patient records or um, interviewing the patient um, to identify were they exposed um, to, to the risk factor or the intervention um, that um, is of interest. So in this case um, we've got um, our cases um, uh, an NTD effect of pregnancy and we're trying to identify those women of those uh, uh, whether or not they um, consume folic acid or not um, and then we um, identify a, um, a group of controls so they're matched um, like for like for our cases uh, apart from the fact um, that they differ in their outcomes and so the controls are uh, women um, without a, uh, an NTD effect of pregnancy um, and then we similarly work backwards to identify were they exposed or not uh, to the particular um, intervention or risk factor of interest. The last um, type of study that I'll, I'll briefly discuss um, are what we call step wedged cluster trials. Um, so as the name suggests, a, a cluster trial rather than recruiting and um, uh, allocating at an individual level, um, cluster trials do so um, on, on a cluster level. So 
whether it be um, you know, you're, you're conducting a trial at a hospital, the clusters may be wards. Um, you can go um, more more bigger picture, I guess, and um, look to um, recruit n uh, different hospitals um, and use those as clusters to um, randomise people to the in intervention or the control. So you may be doing a study about um, a, a particular um, uh, intervention or whatnot, um, and you may decide to use hospitals such as the Alfred or Dandenong or Mildura Base Hospital or whatever it may be as your clusters. Um, uh, and so everyone attending that particular hospital is randomised to the same intervention. So in this case we've got, um, or in this example, we've got four clusters um, during the first period. Um, all four clusters um, are exposed to the uh, control or placebo condition or whatever it may be. Um, in the second period, um, we begin by having uh, cluster one uh, switch over to the intervention, uh, whereas clusters uh, two, three and four still remain in our control um, group. Um, period three, um, cluster one still remains as our intervention, but now cluster two, let's say a hospital two, converts um, over into uh, the intervention group. Um, and so they're all exposed uh, to the intervention. Um, and then so on during periods four and five. And so what in fact you get is a, um, a cluster randomised controlled trial, but you also get um, a certain level of a, um, a before and after study within the groups. So you can, uh, for example, see with um, um, uh, cluster three um, that they, they don't get exposed to the intervention until uh, period four. Um, so you have an, a neat sort of um, timeline or time series um, that you can monitor um, patient progress uh, with. That's it for this uh, particular slide. Uh, feel free to contact me if you have any questions. See you next time.